Thank you, Richard. Um, let's move on to the architecture part, which, uh, oh, sorry. Hi. Uh, now we're going to move on to the architecture. But as many of you noticed uh, in the slides that Richard presented, uh, many of which are pictures from the book I recognized, uh, the architecture and the art are already starting to come together, um, much along that same theme that I presented earlier. Uh, and I'm actually seeing in those slides even more connectivity between them. Uh, and I won't go into it now, but if someone wants to talk to me about it later, I noticed how slender the Marc uh, de Souvreau, uh element was and matching the slenderness of the columns of Tom's uh, window treatment there. Uh, and the house is loaded with those types of uh, coincidences. Uh, many of them probably planned, but a whole host of them not. Uh, and that's, uh, I do recall Dad mentioning, was one of the real joys of Hoover Ness. Uh, was just discovering what happens after uh, building something through this long-winded and very thorough process uh, to only find that there's more that you could not have planned for. Uh, and uh, I'm still seeing that today as I start to uh, engage with the house both personally and in these slides. So related to architecture, I thought I'd read a few passages um, and again, you'll hear some of the same themes. But uh, the one that I think uh, really tells the whole story is uh, of all three uh, elements that we're talking about tonight uh, is from page 57. I have always wanted to live in a greenhouse surrounded by plants. I still remember the smells and sights in the floor shop in the neighboring town where I worked as a teenager during the Easter holidays. When I was in high school, I asked for a greenhouse every Christmas. At Cornell, I visited the greenhouse on the agricultural campus at least once a week. And now when I visit botanical gardens, I return to my childhood dream. A modernist steel and glass house was to become my greenhouse. Continuing on this idea of modernism, he then says, I think of modernism as being about abstraction of form, space, and light. I wanted a house that dealt with these elements in an abstract way. And continuing much later in the book, uh, I believe it's in the chapter about the garden, uh, on abstraction, he writes, the rearrangement of identifiable characteristics, form, line, scale, space, color, so that one or more of these characteristics departs from reality and assumes a new identity and relationship to other elements provides the basis for abstraction as an improvisation on reality. Uh, reading that passage uh, got me thinking that perhaps one of Dad's greatest achievements of abstraction in the house was hiding the second and third bedrooms in the sofa and the daybed. Uh, well, so without further ado, I'll let Tom Pfeiffer illuminate uh, us more about the architecture. Thanks. Thank you so much. It's so, so wonderful to be here. There's so many. This is such a great testament to Tom and uh, such an honor to be invited by the Armstrong family here tonight. I really, really appreciate it. And I, it was such an honor to work with Tom for so many years. We were attached to the hip, and I mean to the hip, here for seven years um, as we were working on the house during the construction of the house. And then after the house was built, I think we met even more after the house was built than we met while it was going on. It was quite an extraordinary process. And through all of it, through all the debates, all the conversation, all of the meetings, all of the meetings on the site, we had we really developed quite a dialogue and quite a relationship and talked about this connection between art, architecture, and the landscape. And I think we finally ended up with something that I didn't expect and something that Tom didn't expect. That what was his was mine and what was mine was his. It became a house where we really did become inseparable. It was that close and it was that wonderful. And um, 
So I speak tonight, hopefully, with Tom's voice as well. Um, what I'd like to do first, how do I see if I'm not very text savvy? See, I'm the only one that needed him. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is when I arrived to the site, and you know, I took these pictures on this day. It was a little cloudy, a little foggy. I love Fisher's Island when it gets this way. You could hardly make it across. And I had heard that the house had burned down. And when you arrived there, Tom had vacuumed the grass <laughs> on the little plinth. And I, you know, where was the house? You know, I'd been there a couple of Thanksgivings ago. <laughs> but, but it was really quite amazing that he had turned this, this kind of destruction here into quite an extraordinary plinth. And, you know, he kept telling me, well, the pool has to stay and the hedges have to stay. And, you know, we gradually made our way to the design of the house that you see. But this, this, this was quite a wonderful moment here when he invited me up and we began the process of working together. And this is a wonderful photograph by Scott Francis that he took. And it kind of encapsulates what Tom and I were working on for all these years. And we began to think about a house that would blur the distinction between architecture and the landscape and, incidentally, the art. And we looked at the Japanese temple and the way that the garden began to make its transition to the porch. And as you move further and further in, it got slightly darker. That the trellis was a frame to the garden when you're inside, but it was also a scrim to the sky. That it began to kind of sift the light through in a, in a, in a very soft way and began to see nature through this scrim as you got further and further into the house. And then as Tom and I began to talk about how to respond to these two axes that existed on the site, you remember Tom had worked on his garden forever and ever and had established these two axes that were there. One of these axes is, I hope I don't push the wrong button here, pointer, that's good. Um, this was one of the axes right here, the moss garden that comes through. And that as well began to blur the distinction here as the garden really became a part of the house. And we used a, a slightly reflective coating on the glass. So at some moments, when the sun is exactly right, the house becomes completely transparent. And at other times, it begins to behave like this, where you get a reflection of the garden and um, a reflection of the house so that it begins to kind of merge the two. It gently kind of brings them together, as well as blurring the distinction between that and these gardens that begin to penetrate the house and make those connections that Tom wanted to make between his work, the moss gardens, and the new garden that he made on the southern side of the house. And then as Tom and I began to meet over these years, and we began to think about how to furnish the house. We placed these kind of sculpted skylights over so that these moments in the house over this table here in the library would have a very special connection there um, to several occurrences that happened there in the house. And then as we started to develop the plan for the house, we began to place the rooms very carefully together. And this master bedroom is my favorite place. See, I knew I was going to do that. There you go. Um, this is the master bedroom right here. And this is the little apse that existed. This beautiful little place right here with this bird bath. This is the most extraordinary view of the sound as the linden trees were limbed up beautifully by Mike and Tom the apps there, the, the rock, the slightly reflective glass there. And as you lie in bed under the little skylight, framing the garden, shaded by the trellis there on the eastern side, you sleep right against this little apse. And that was, that was wonderful that we discovered that little place there with Tom. This is the little garden that's just off of the study, the moss garden, and how the Japanese print here um, started to make the connection to the moss garden and then hence making the connection through. And that really brought the sense of the garden 
inside the house and the quality of light that the trellis delivered, a very soft quality right here, that the spirit of the Japanese house, the connection between the garden and the architecture began um, to have a voice together. And this was, this was Tom, one of Tom's favorite photographs here, how as you arrive at the house, you come in the front door and you see the sound and you make this, this very, um, this pool here that's completely flush with the grass with the disappearing edge so that the house then finally makes the connection in a very subtle but very important way with the water and the sound. Otherwise, this house, from Tom's perspective, would have sat there in the garden making those appropriate connections, but the water was a happenstance. And here, we both wanted to tie the water together so that the sound really was pulled back into the house. And the movement of the water as it began and it started in this first pool in the house moved through the little runnel and came out and was expressed in the pool and then disappeared. It became something that moved, that traveled along and began to, um, to have a voice also in the spirit of the house. And what was great about making the house with Tom is that he was like a restoration landscape architect. He kept these pieces really close and, you know, as the trellis came in, yes, we had to trim, but we trimmed with scissors rather than clippers there to, to keep these trees really close so the, so the architecture was, was really embedded in the spirit of the house. <coughs>